Tina and I were going to talk about cardiovascular structure, so we divided this lecture into three parts. We're going to first talk about the thoracic cavity. Uh, so we talked about the thorax last week with Brendan and Morgan, so we're kind of just going to build upon that since in the thorax we have the pulmonary, the, the pulmonary cavities, and now we're going to add on the heart to that. Then once we talk about the thorax itself, then we're going to add on the internal, the external structures of the heart. And then once I talk, finish talking about the heart itself, then Sabrina is going to talk to you guys about the path of blood through the circulatory system. So just like a quick, before we start, uh, Sabrina and I were talking about this. And what's hard about the cardiovascular structure is that you guys kind of have to learn and understand everything at once, which makes it really hard. So what we encourage you guys to do is that once we finish lecturing you guys, whether it's today or tomorrow or next week, we encourage you guys to go back to these slides and then redo it all over again, because you can't really fully understand the structures of the heart without knowing the path of blood. And then you can't fully understand the path of blood through the circulatory system without knowing the chambers of the heart. So once we finish lecturing to you guys, we encourage you guys to go back and then it'll start clicking. Um, so if you guys don't get much out of this today, that's completely fine. Maybe you guys are smarter than me, but the first time I did cardio, I didn't get it. I probably got it the fifth or the sixth time. So that's just like the quick um, introduction. So last week, uh, Brendan and Morgan talked about the pulmonary cavity. So now what we're going to talk about is the mediastinum. So what's the mediastinum? The mediastinum is basically the central compartment that's in between the pulmonary cavities that you guys talked about last week. So it's located in between the lungs in the middle, and it's in between the superior thoracic aperture and then inferiorly the diaphragm. So again, the, the lungs aren't part of the mediastinum. The mediastinum is basically what's in the middle in between the two pulmonary cavities that you guys talked about last week. So then the mediastinum then can be further subdivided into the superior mediastinum and inferior mediastinum. So you can see it here. I don't know if you can see my pointer, my pointer mouse maybe. So you have the superior mediastinum and inferior mediastinum. So the superior mediastinum is going to consist of everything that's above the heart, superior to the heart. So that'll contain the aortic arch, which you guys talked about with Brendan last week, uh, the trachea, the beginning of the trachea, and the esophagus. And then once you get to the sternal angle, so again, review from last week, again, these lectures are going to accumulate. Uh, so you guys should know about the sternal angle already. The sternal angle will then divide the superior mediastinum into the inferior mediastinum. And then it gets even more confusing is that we Anatomists like to subdivide the inferior mediastinum into three parts, anterior, middle, and posterior. So again, we're using these anatomy terms that we talked about with Madison uh, and Ben in week one. Again, what's anterior, posterior, superior, inferior. So make sure that you guys are familiar with these terms. So now the inferior mediastinum then consists of anterior, middle, posterior. So what's anterior? Again, anterior is going to be everything that's anterior to the heart. So that's not much. It's a lot of fat, a lot of connective tissue, the thymus, which is a lymphoid organ. Maybe you guys don't know about it, but you guys will learn that later when we talk about the immune system in medical school or in any of your lectures. And then once you get to the middle mediastinum, that's the heart itself. So the heart is the middle mediastinum. So a lot of people think that the mediastinum is only the heart, but technically the heart is only the middle inferior mediastinum. So that will consist of the coverings of the heart and then the chambers itself. And then posterior to that is going to be everything that's behind the heart, posterior to the heart, and that's called the posterior mediastinum. So that's going to have consists of the descending aorta, which Sabrina will talk about, um, and then everything, a lot of nerves that we won't have time to talk about today. So again, talking a lot, but it can be just subdivided mediastinum, cavity in between the lungs, superior mediastinum is above the heart, inferior mediastinum, the heart itself, and then the inferior mediastinum can then be divided into the anterior, middle, and posterior mediastinum. And now if we go back to this, if we go to this slide, this is just a quick review from last week. So now we talked about the sternal angle last week. Brendan and Morgan did an excellent job. So again, quick review of the sternum. The sternum is, consists of three flat bones. So you have the manubrium, the sternal body, and then the xiphoid process. And then the sternal angle is sort of the angle of Louis. It's this palette. You can actually find it. It's a great surface anatomy landmark in order to count ribs. A lot of clinicians and anatomists use this when you want to auscultate or perform any type of medical procedures. So that you can actually feel it. So that's the palpable connection in between the manubrium and then the sternal body. 
So the most important part is that it's used to sort of ascertain the position of rib two in order to count the ribs, because you can't really find rib one. So you always use that sternal angle that you can actually touch and feel to start counting from rib two onwards. And then another thing is that we talked about the sternal angle last week, but now you can use that sort of surface anatomy landmark to then separate the superior and inferior portions of the mediastinum. So then you know that the heart is gonna be inferior to that sternal angle, which is uh, that ridge that you can actually feel yourself. So again, feel free to use this slide to review and then review um, last week's lecture too. So this is a quick question. I want you guys to first orient yourself. So what scan is this? Try to figure out what's anterior, what's posterior. And I found some CT scans with tumors and the yellow arrow points to the tumor. So I want you guys to look at uh, the CT scan number one and tell me in what mediastinum do you guys think this is? So in order to answer that, you guys need to find out is this scan above the heart, at the level of the heart, or below the heart. So I'll give you guys a couple seconds if you want to, some people want to answer. Okay, so we're getting some answers in. Yeah, superior, exactly, so that's correct. So the way to know that this is a superior mediastinum is that you have to read this scan and know that it's above the level of the heart because here you can see the aortic arch and the aortic arch so we talked to brendan talked about that last week that you can see that this scan is above the heart which so that's the superior mediastinum so this this tumor is at the level of the superior mediastinum so now to uh, scan number two i'll give you guys 15 seconds if some people want to answer so what mediastinum is this tumor located in okay we're getting some answers Yeah, posterior, exactly. So first, try to orient yourself. Are we at the level of the heart? Are we above the heart? Again, we're at the level of the heart. So then the level at the level of the heart, that's going to be the inferior mediastinum. And like we said, we can then subdivide the inferior mediastinum into the anterior, middle, and posterior. And we can see that this is posterior to the heart. So here, someone asked which mass is the tumor and which is the heart. Uh, here is the heart, and this is posterior. We can see the thoracic vertebrae right here. So the mass is kind of coming out of the thoracic vertebrae. So it's uh, posterior. Someone asked, would it be lateral? Yeah, like probably posterior, posterior lateral. For the sake of the question, posterior mediastinum is the correct answer. And now for uh, slide number three. So can you guys tell me in what mediastinum do you guys think this is? Okay, we're getting some answers. Yeah, perfect, middle. So here again, try to orient yourself. Are we in superior or inferior mediastinum? Here we can see the heart. So we're at the level of the inferior mediastinum. And then we can see that the tumor is kind of coming out off the heart, so it's the middle. Um, some people could say that maybe uh, it's part of the posterior mediastinum. So I think middle and posterior are both correct answers. Okay, great. So now, now that we've talked about uh, the mediastinum. Now we're going to talk about some surface anatomy landmarks. So where is the heart located? If you were to sort of look at a patient's chest, how is the heart placed? So the heart is kind of oriented in a, in a very weird way. It's kind of pointing downwards. If you guys can see here, it's oriented downwards 45 degrees and rotated a little bit to the left. So a great way that a lot of clinicians use is they use a lot of these surface anatomy landmarks. So we already talked about the sternal angle. Again, used to ascertain for position of rib two, that's labeled right here. So the sternal angle is used to locate the upper superior border of the heart. And then the lower inferior border of the heart, you can sort of use the xiphoid process, which you guys learned about last week, as the inferior border. Then we can talk about uh, the left border of the heart. The left border of the heart can be an uh, the left inferior board of the heart can you can use what's called the midclavicular line. So again, if you don't know what a word is in anatomy, try to decipher it with the word midclavicular, middle of the clavicle. So if you were to draw an imaginary line, so touch your clavicle here, try to find the middle and then form a line all the way to the end. That's going to be your middle clavicular line. So the left border of the heart is going to be at the level of the midclavicular line at the fifth intercostal space. So that's where the apex is located. And again, intercostal space. What's an intercostal space? In between the ribs. So for any of the French people out there, cost in gut 
means rib in French. So anything that has the word costs in it, costal, means in relationship to the ribs. So intercostal in between the ribs. Fifth intercostal space. So again, you guys can practice trying to find and count the ribs itself. If you use your sternal angle, that starts at rib two, and then you start counting below. Find rib two, second intercostal space, rib three, rib four, with rib five. So uh, it takes a lot of practice, but once you guys get used to it, you'll realize that it's pretty easy to count the ribs. And then if you talk about, if here, if you look at the right border of the heart, the right border of the heart can be, you can use what's called the parasternal line. So again, what's parasternal? Para next to sternum, parasternum. So again, we talked about the sternum last week. If you take the sternum, the parasternal line is sort of the line that's right next to the sternum. And that's used to sort of find the right border of the heart. Um, so then you guys are probably asking, why am I teaching you guys this? And it's actually really, really important because you use these surface anatomy landmarks and you need to know where the heart is in order to auscultate for the valve. So again, I'm not going to, we don't have time to teach to you guys about valve auscultation, but Sabrina is going to talk to you guys about the valves in a bit and knowing where the heart is and knowing how to find these surface anatomy landmarks is really important because once you're a clinician uh, or a healthcare professional, you need to know these positions to ask auscultate for the different valves. So there's four different valves and you need to be able to know where to put your stethoscope. Oh, okay, so I wanna to listen to the aortic valve. I know that it's here. I'm gonna use these surface anatomy landmarks to be able to properly listen and auscultate at different positions in order to find different pathologies. So this is just a slide for reference so that you guys can sort of correlate this clinically and understand why we're teaching you guys this. So now that we talked about these surface anatomy landmarks, we talked about the mediastinum, now we're gonna start talking about the heart itself. So the heart is covered by something called the pericardium and sort of pericardial sac that covers the heart. So can someone tell me what is the analogous structure of the pericardium to the lungs that you guys learned about last week? So what's the pericardium? Exactly, pleura, exactly. So it's kind of the same thing. You guys learned about the pleura and the pleural cavity last week the heart also has a similar covering. It's just called the pericardium. So the purpose of the pericardium is to protect the heart. So again, like the pleura and the lungs, you need this covering to protect the muscle of the heart. Now the pericardium can then be subdivided into different layers. So you have the outermost layer, you can see it here, and I really like this image. The outermost layer, it's called fibrous pericardium. So it's gonna be the most outer layer and it's comprised of fibrous tissue. So that will provide the outer border of the heart. After, once you go sort of more inside, you have the serous pericardium. So here you can see, I like this image because you can see the blue and the green lines. The serous pericardium can then be su further subdivided into the parietal and visceral pericardium. So again, review your slides from last week, same thing, pleural and pleural cavity, analogous structure in the heart, parietal and visceral layers of serous pericardium. So now can you guys tell me what is going to be located inside the pericardial cavity. So what can you guys find in between the parietal and visceral layers? Yeah, pericardial fluid, exactly. And can someone tell me why we have pericardial fluid? Does anyone know like what the purpose of it is? Yeah, exactly, lubrication, protection, uh, friction, exactly, to prevent friction. So it, it serves as protection. So again, same thing, Pleural fluid for the lungs, pericardial fluid. Uh, so it provides lubrication to assist in the movements of the heart since its heart's main function is to pump blood. And now that we've, now that we've talked about the pericardium, let me go to the next slide. Oh yeah, so this is actually a slide for your own reference. I kind of like to use this sort of fist in a balloon. If you guys have trouble visualizing uh, pericardial cavity or pleural cavity, I kind of like to use this. It, it, if this also works for the lungs. So imagine that the heart is your fist and you have a balloon and then the, the basically the layers of the, the pericardium kind of just go like this. And then the fluid is gonna be everything that's inside the balloon. So now can someone tell me what a pericardial effusion is? Does anyone know what a pericardial effusion is? Yeah, exactly. So it's buildup of fluid. So you ideally want some fluid to assist in lubrication, prevent friction, all the things that you guys said, but it's a problem if you have too much fluid. Why is that a problem? Does anyone know why a buildup of fluid would be problematic? Yeah, pressure, exactly. So it's heart's 
main function is to pump blood. But if you have so much fluid putting pressure on the heart, the heart isn't going to be able to pump effectively. And we don't want that because it's the heart is a muscle. Some say it's the most important muscle in the body. And if you have all this fluid sort of compressing that muscle, it's not going to be able to do its job. And that's really bad. So now can someone tell me if someone has all this buildup of fluid, a pericardial effusion, how do you remove the fluid? That's the next question. So we have drain it, pericardial synthesis. We have lots of answers here. Inserting a needle. Yep, exactly. So in order to remove the fluid, you actually insert a needle to remove the fluid. So you want to, it's called a pericardial synthesis. So you want to insert the needle all the way into, in between the layers of the, the, the parietal and visceral layers, and then sort of drain the fluid out. So can anyone tell me what the risks are when you perform a pericardial effusion? Hitting the heart itself, infection, puncturing the heart, puncture. Yeah, exactly. So you guys got it right. I mean, what's really risky about this is that you don't want to puncture the heart muscle, the myocardium. So that's why a lot of people use this procedure is used with an ultrasound to guide the needle. Because if you puncture the heart, that'll cause a lot of problems. So that's definitely what you don't want. Um, so then you use an ultrasound sort of to put the needle all the way into the, into the pericardial cavity and then bring the fluid out. Can anyone tell me also why uh, this procedure you also use an EKG for? So an EKG is also useful uh, in addition to ultrasound. Can anyone tell me why? Someone's saying to check heart rate, to monitor the heart, any abnormalities. Yeah, exactly. So the, problem, so the EKG is to sort of monitor for the heart if there are any problems. So for example, for any myocardial infarctions, heart attacks, et cetera, and things that you guys will learn later. But if you puncture the myocardium, the heart muscle, the heart is going to show signs of stress on an EKG. So you can use the EKG while you're performing this procedure to then monitor if you've actually punctured the heart itself. So again, just a quick summary, pericardial effusion, buildup of fluid. You relieve it by inserting a needle, taking the fluid out. And this procedure is done with an ultrasound and an EKG. And can anyone tell me the other name for a pericardial effusion if it causes that much pressure that the heart can't pump anymore? I think some people talk, uh, yeah, exactly, cardiac tamponade. So if you guys watch a lot of medical TV shows, now you guys can actually define what this is. So a cardiac tamponade is a pericardial effusion that, and that the buildup of fluid is big enough that the heart cannot pump efficiently. And that's what's a, uh, called the, that's the pericardial, the cardiac tamponade. Okay, so I've talked a lot. Um, if there are any like in questions, you guys feel free to write it down. Madison is an MS2, so hopefully she'll be able to answer some of your questions. Uh, so someone asked, how does that differ from congestive heart failure? That's, we're not able to talk about that today. Congestive heart failure is sort of another, uh, but I encourage you guys to look at some YouTube videos if you guys wanna uh, look at what congestive heart failure is. So someone's talking about where you insert the needle. So again, I actually wrote some notes. I won't be able to talk about it that much today, but there's the peristernal approach and the subsifoid approach. So either you insert the needle in the fifth intercostal space near the sternum, or you insert the needle inferior to the xiphoid. So I put some notes um, in the slides and then feel free to look at YouTube videos uh, if you guys wanna look at the procedure itself and then how you perform it. Okay, so now that we've talked about the pericardium, we're gonna talk about the structure of the heart itself. So the heart is again, pyramidal shaped. It's this muscular pump. Its main function is to pump blood throughout the heart. Um, and it consists of four chambers, the atria and the ventricle. So you have the right and the left atria on the top, superiorly, and then the right and left ventricles in the bottom. So again, this is a coronal view. Again, review from week one, we talked about coronal. So just if you guys still have some trouble with the anatomical uh, terms, feel free to go to the first lecture to make sure that you guys are familiar with all of these uh, terms. So this is a coronal view where you can see the left and right atria and then the left and right ventricle. So now, and then here you guys see at the interventricular septum. So these ventricle and atria all have to be separated from each other because there's chambers where blood is gonna pass through. And then you have what's called a septum that separates the right and the left ventricles. So can someone tell me what would happen if you had a hole in the interventricular septum? Would that be problematic? <laughs> 
yeah, exactly. Mixing of blood, VSD, that's, you know, uh, outside of today's knowledge, but you guys are right. Pressure changes, mixing of blood, inaccurate blood flow, bypass, murmurs, you guys are all correct. So if you, a lot of embryological problems stem from the fact that the septa can probably ha has holes in it, which means that the right ventricle will then pump blood into the left ventricle or vice versa. Again, that's outside the scope of today, but what I'm saying is that there can be a lot of problems and that there's holes in the septa that'll lead to mixing of blood. So in a bit, Sabrina is gonna talk to you guys about the path of blood, but then if you have a hole, then that path of blood is gonna be, um, it's not gonna go the way that it's supposed to go. And that can cause a lot of the problems because of the mixing of blood. And if you guys wanna learn more about that, feel free to email me after and I can give you guys some resources um, for later. So here we can see the anterior view and the posterior view. So anteriorly, you can see the right ventricle, the left ventricle and the right atrium. And then you can't see the left atrium in the anterior view because it's posteriorly. So the email, my email is gonna be at the end. It's at the end of the slide. Uh, so here you see in the posterior view, you can see the left atrium. So again, the most anteriorly, you have the right ventricle and then posterior you have the left atrium. So here on the next slide, this is actually a better view to look at the orientation of the heart. So again, these images are in 2D and the heart's in 3D. So it's really hard to sort of visualize where the ventricles and the atria are. So if you guys don't get much out of this, that's completely okay, I didn't. A, big, a better way to do this is to look at videos, look at different images, and it's hard that this is virtual, but for me, it only finally clicked when I actually had a heart in my hands uh, in medical school, and I sort of had the ability to rotate it uh, and be able to see where the ventricles and the atria are. Um, so if you guys don't fully understand the orientation of the heart from these 2D images, that's completely okay. I encourage, if you guys are interested, I encourage you guys to look at heart anatomy videos on YouTube, uh, and be able to sort of find the orientations, the orientation of the heart, and it'll just be more clear for you. Uh, so we talked about the anterior and the posterior surface. We can even subdivide that. We have the, an the anterior border, which consists of the right ventricle, portions of the right atrium and the left ventricle. Then we have the posterior surface, which consists mostly of the left atrium. Um, the inferior border, we also like to call the diaphragmatic surface also contains portions of the left ventricle and portions of the right ventricle, and the right border consists of the right atrium. And then we have the pulmonary surface too. Uh, so again, just, I feel free to go back to these slides. And all of this, again, is gonna make much more sense to you once you guys know the path of blood. So once Sabrina's finished with your talk, I encourage you to start back to zero and look at these slides because it'll make a lot more sense to you of, like for example, the left atrium, you can see the pulmonary veins coming in, um, it'll just make a lot more sense for you guys to visualize it once you guys know the path of blood. So again, I encourage you guys to go back to these slides after uh, Sabrina's talk and it, it'll, you'll start making the connections. And again, this is just for reference for you guys. So a lot of anatomists and clinicians talk about the grooves of the heart. Sabrina's gonna talk to them, talk about them more extensively. So these are kind of grooves or spaces on the heart that are occupied by vasculature. So a lot of the vessels, so arteries and veins are gonna run along these grooves. So it's the coronary vasculature. Sabrina's gonna talk about this. So once you guys learn about the vasculature of the heart, I encourage you guys to go back to the slide for your own reference, and then you'll be able to see that these grooves sort of separate the ventricles into left and right, um, and it'll just make a lot more sense for you. So now we're gonna talk about, I'll talk about the characteristics of the atria and the ventricles. So again, the heart, we always like to talk about the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart. So the right side of the heart is where blood that's been deoxygenated from your body. So your body's gonna use oxygen. All that deoxygenated blood needs to go to the right heart and that's gonna be venous blood. So deoxygenated blood. So again, Sabrina's gonna talk about this more extensively but I'm just giving you guys an overview so you guys have a, a better understanding. Deoxygenated blood will go to the right heart, to right side of the heart. Then that deoxygenated blood is gonna leave the right heart, go to the lungs, get the oxygen from the lungs and then go back to the left side of the heart. So when people talk about the right side of the heart, that's deoxygenated venous blood that's coming in from the body. And when people talk about the left side of the heart, that's oxygenated blood coming from the lungs and then going to the left side of the heart to then uh, provide oxygen for the rest of the body. So now here, this is a slide talking about the right atrium. So the right side of the heart, right atrium, this is where venous blood comes in from the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. Um, 
And there's a lot of characteristics from the right atrium. So if you look, dissect a heart and have the opportunity in the future, once you're in medical school, to see a heart pro section, you guys will be able to see all of these characteristics live. So a big characteristic of the right atrium is what's called pectinate muscle. So you can see that here. Pectinate muscle is a muscle present on the inner wall of the right and left atria. You have also what's called the crista terminalis, which is sort of a smooth muscular ridge that will divide the, this rough muscle called pectinate muscle and then the smooth surface of the right atrium. Then you also can see in the right atrium something very cool that's called the fossa ovalis. So remember when we talked about a few minutes ago, if there's a hole in the septum, then you get mixing of blood and that's a bad thing. That can also be a good thing when you're in the fetus and you're not born yet. So when, uh, you're, when you're not born yet, a baby doesn't get oxygen from the lungs. It actually gets oxygen from the mother and the placenta. So that oxygen, the, that blood doesn't need to go to the lungs. So then you, you have this frame in ovale, it's called a shunt, where uh, it's sort of a bypass so that the heart doesn't, the blood doesn't need to go to the lungs and back. So again, this might be confusing. I'm just using this as a, uh, as a reference. And if you guys wanna learn more about fetal blood flow, that's sort of another lecture, but feel free to email me and I can send you a couple of YouTube videos. So again, just a summary characteristics of right atrium. You have pectinate muscle, the crista, uh, the crista terminalis, and the fossa ovalis, which is a remnant of the foramen ovale, which is a shunt between the right and left atria. So now to the right ventricle. So again, we're still uh, in the right heart. The right ventricle has another type of muscle called the trabeculate carne. So again, it's confusing because the trabeculate carne can easily be confused with pectinate muscle, but it's not pectinate. It's called trabeculate carne. So it's this rounded, irregular, rough looking muscle columns that project uh, from the inner surface of the right and left ventricles. Um, and then you have what's called papillary muscle. So Sabrina is going to talk to you guys about valves. So valves are doors that sort of, I kind of like to think of them as doors. So she's going to talk about the path of blood, but in order for blood to go from one chamber to another, there needs to be a pathway for it. And that's what the valves do. So valves are doors that sort of open and close so that the blood can flow. But these valves need to be open and closed at very important times in order for that path of blood to be, to be effective. And the papillary muscle and chordae tendineae, which are the heartstrings, are involved in opening and closing those valves. So again, this will make a lot more sense to you once uh, we, we learn about the valves and the path of blood. So again, I encourage you guys to go back to these slides at the end of the lecture, and it'll make a lot more sense to you. So again, just summary characteristics of the right ventricle, trabeculae carne, uh, chordae tendineae, papillary muscle. And this is a section uh, where you can see the left atrium and the ventricles. Um, so here in the left ventricle, you also have trabeculae carne. Uh, you can see the papillary muscle, the heart strings of chordae tendineae, and the left atrium is sort of very floppy. It's posterior, as you can see here, and that's where the opening for the pulmonary veins are. Um, so some people are asking for the slides. So the slides are in the Brain Turns Google Drive, and they're also in the, um, in the, on the Facebook page. I believe Joshua posted them uh, last night, so you guys should be able to find them there. So I'm going to pass this on to Sabrina, who's going to talk to you guys about the uh, organization of blood flow. Okay, and you're just going to have to click through the slides for me. I got you. Uh, can you go back one? There you go. Okay, so we talked a bit about the heart and the structure of it, but we're going to get a little bit more into the function of it within the body before we go back to the rest of the details of the structure. So the main purpose of the heart is to be a pump that's gonna take the blood and then redistribute it into a new circuit throughout the body. So there's two circuits that function connecting through the heart. There's the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. So Marion mentioned the intraatrial and intraventricular septum that divide the left and right atrium and the left and right ventricles. And those exist to prevent mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Um, in general, the way the heart is structured, if you have an artery, it's going away from the heart. And if you have a vein, it's going to the heart. Uh, you don't wanna think about artery and vein in terms of oxygenated and deoxygenated because as I'll mention, there is a time in which your vein is gonna have oxygenated blood and an artery is gonna have deoxygenated blood. Um, so the right heart side of the heart is gonna handle all the deoxygenated blood um, of the body. It's taking the blood from the systemic veins the major systemic veins are the SVC, which is going to drain the 
superior top part of the body and the IVC, which is gonna drain the inferior bottom part. Uh, that's the superior and inferior vena cava. Uh, there is also the coronary sinus, which I'll talk a little bit later, which is gonna drain the deoxygenated blood of the heart itself. Um, and then the right side of the heart is gonna take this deoxygenated blood, it's gonna send it to the lungs, which you talked about last week, is gonna exist to oxygenate the blood. Um, and then the left side of the heart has all the oxygenated blood. So it's taking the newly oxygenated blood from the lungs, sending it between the left and uh, left atrium and left ventricle, and then pumping it out to the systemic circulation through the aorta and all of its branches. Um, so the general organization of blood flow is that blood is going to come from the heart to an artery, then it's going to pass through a capillary bed, then it's going to enter a vein and go back to the right side of the heart. Uh, capillaries, I won't talk about too much, but just to say that's the site where the oxygen and the nutrients in the blood in the arteries is going to be sent to the tissues, and then the tissues are going to send the carbon dioxide and the waste back into the veins to go back to the heart to be expelled in the lungs as carbon dioxide. Um, the only time in which you have a capillary bed that does not drain directly back to the heart is in the liver. That's the uh, hepatic portal system, which I believe you'll talk a little bit more in, I think it's the next week, about the abdominal anatomy. Um, but in general, the capillary bed will then drain into a vein, which goes back to the right side of the heart. Um, I won't talk about lymph too much, but if you've ever heard of the lymphatic system, it pretty much exists to drain any extra fluid from your capillaries that can't go back into your veins. Um, and then this fluid is sent back to the right side of the heart uh, to go and be oxygenated. If you could go to the next slide, Marian. So I have a, quick, a couple of clinical cases for you guys, so feel free to answer this. Um, so here we have a 56-year-old woman presenting to the emergency department with sharp chest pain and shortness of breath. She's got a history of oral contraceptive use. Her right calf appears red and swollen. Um, and on a vascular ultrasound, you find evidence of DVT, which means deep vein thrombosis in her right calf. Um, on CT, you find a large PE, which is a pulmonary embolism in her right pulmonary artery. So which of these would be the correct path that the embolus traveled to go from her right calf to her right pulmonary artery? All right, yeah, everyone putting C. That is the correct answer. So it's I skipped a bit of parts in answering this question, but generally you're going to go from an iliac vein because you have a deep vein thrombosis um, to the IVC, which is going to drain the inferior bottom part of the body through the right atria and ventricle because they're dealing with the deoxygenated blood from the veins. Then it's going to enter the pulmonary trunk and then lodge itself in the right uh, pulmonary artery. Uh, you can go to the next one, Marianne. So Marianne kind of alluded to this earlier, and now we're gonna talk about the structure in a little more detail, but there are four valves within the heart. Um, you have the septum, which are gonna separate the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, creating the left and right sides of the heart, but the valves are what exist to prevent the backflow of blood. So for the heart to pump and function as it's supposed to, you need to have a one-way flow of blood through the correct chambers, um, creating the two circuits. There's two types of valves, that you have the AV valves, the atrioventricular valves, which as the name suggests, are going to divide the atria and the ventricles. And then you have the semilunar valve, which are going to separate the ventricles and the great arteries that uh, leave through the outflow tracts. Um, importantly, there is no valve between the veins and the artery, and the atrium, sorry. Uh, so you constantly have blood coming from the vena cava and the pulmonary veins into the left and right atrium. There's no valve there that's gonna prevent it. It's essentially the uh, pressure differences in blood flow that is gonna cause the blood to flow into the atrium. Uh, so then these valves, in order for the heart to function normally, need to open and close at the correct times. Uh, the pressure differences within the chambers is what's going to open and close these valves. And the correct order in which they're open and closed is creating the cardiac cycle. Um, which is what is necessary for your heart to actually function as a pump. Um, does anyone know what it's called if you have a valve that dysfunctions? Uh, it generally will show up on auscultation. That's kind of a broad term. 
Right, you're going to have a murmur. So we won't talk a much about the pathology of heart murmurs, but generally, if you have a valve or a couple of other holes in the heart that are allowing blood to flow through when they're not supposed to, you're going to get an extra noise. Um, you can figure out what valve is dysfunctioning based off of when you hear the noise within the cardiac cycle, which I'll talk a little bit about in the next two slides, and where you can hear it best in the um, on the chest, as Marian talked about, with the different locations where you can hear the valves. And that's why knowing the surface anatomy of the heart is so important to figure out underlying pathology. Because with nothing more than a stethoscope, you can um, diagnose different heart murmurs and potentially different valve pathologies. Um, you can go to the next one, Marianne. So AV valves or atrioventricular valves are the valves that separate the atria and the ventricles. You have two, one on the right side, one on the left. Um, AV valves have a distinctive structure in which they have two or three valve leaflets, which is the top part of the diagram on the left. The leaflets are connected to chordae tendinae, and then the chordae tendinae are connected to papillary muscles. Uh, the papillary muscles are continuous with the myocardium of the ventricles. So the papillary muscles and chordae tendinae, contrary to what some people might think instinctively, they don't pull the valve open. You have no actual pulling of the valve. It's the pressure changes that cause the valve to open. The chordae tendinae and papillary muscles exist to prevent the valve from essentially closing too far. Uh, Marianne called the valves kind of a door. So if you think about that typical Old West saloon where the doors can swing both ways, you don't want that in the heart because then you're going to have blood that's going to flow backwards. So these chordae tendinae and papillary muscles exist so that once the valve shuts, it doesn't shut too far. Um, if it does shut too far, that's called a prolapse, if you, I think somebody said earlier um, when I asked about murmurs. But essentially, that's the function of the chordae tendinae. And so on the right side of the heart, you have the tricuspid valve, tri meaning three, there's three leaflets on the tricuspid valve, and then the left side has the mitral valve, also called the bicuspid, since bi means two, uh, there are two leaflets on this side. You can go to the next slide, Marianne. And so then separating the ventricles and the great arteries that are leaving the heart, you have the semilunar valves. Um, they kind of sit at the end of the ventricular outflow tracts and the proximal part of the pulmonary artery or the aorta. Um, so unlike the AV valves, you have no chordae tendinae, no papillary muscles here. You essentially just have three cusps or sinuses, depending on what you look at for a resource. They have different names. Um, and these, you're going to have two. One is the pulmonic valve, which is going to separate the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. And then you're going to have the aortic valve, which separates the left ventricle and the ascending aorta. And so as you can see on the left, the structure is essentially these three kind of cups that all nestle together. And when the valve is closed, they prevent any blood from coming back through. Um, the picture I have on the right is showing the aortic valve, which I will talk a little bit about after in a few slides. But the two arrows are pointing to the coronary artery. So the aortic valve is super important for the correct supply of oxygenated blood to the heart. Um, I think if somebody asked if I, the semilunar valves are tricuspid, yes, they're all, both of the semilunar valves have three um, sinuses. The only valve that essentially doesn't have three leaflets or three sinuses is the mitral valve. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So I kind of mentioned earlier that your valves need to open and close in a particular sequence so that the heart functions normally and it's creating what we call the cardiac cycle, uh, which is that one way blood flow uh, from the body to, through the heart to the lungs, back to the heart and back to the rest of the body. So half of the cardiac cycle is systole. Systole is when your right and left ventricles are contracting and they're expelling the blood from the ventricles into the arteries to deliver blood to the rest of the body. Um, from the right ventricle, it's going into the pulmonary artery, to the lungs, and from the left ventricle, it's going into the aorta, from the ascending aorta to the aortic arch, back down to the descending aorta, um, and into the systemic arteries. At this point, you have open semilunar valves because you obviously want the blood to be able to leave. So by opening the valves, the blood can flow from the ventricles to the great arteries. Um, and then you have the AV valves are closed. You don't want the blood to flow backwards, so while you're squeezing the ventricle, you don't want any blood to enter into the atrium. So the uh, AV valves are closed. Since there are no valves between the veins and the atria, 
you still have blood flowing from the um, great veins like the SVC, the IVC into the atrium, but it can't enter the ventricle. Um, so the at the start of systole, the AV valves close. Uh, they're gonna create what's called the first heart sound, S1, which is at the end of diastole, beginning of systole. Um, so if you're listening to someone's heartbeat or if you've heard that distinctive well dub sound, it's that first noise is called S1 and that's when the AV valves are closing. Um, systole is since it's when blood is being ejected into the rest of the body. If you've ever seen a blood pressure reading, you get two numbers. Uh, there's a larger number on the top and a smaller number on the bottom. So your systolic blood pressure is the pressure you get during systole when the blood is leaving the heart and entering the rest of the body. Um, blood pressure is essentially a measure of how much the blood in your vessels is creating a pressure. So since during systole you have a lot of blood entering the arteries, you're going to have a high blood pressure. So your systolic blood pressure is the higher number on the top of that blood pressure reading. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And so then the other part of the cardiac cycle is diastole. So during diastole, your ventricles are relaxed. The point here is for your heart to fill so that in systole, it can pump and send blood to the rest of the body. Um, you have the AV valves open because you want to be able to fill the ventricles. So you're having blood coming in through the SVC and IVC into the left and right atrium. And then because the AV valves are open, the blood can flow into the ventricles. The semilunar valves are going to be closed. Uh, if you want the ventricles to be able to fill, you don't want the blood to then immediately leave out of the arteries. So you have the semilunar valves closed. At the very end of diastole, you do have contraction of the atria, which is going to push the very final amount of blood from the atrium to the ventricles but the semilunar valves stay closed until systole begins. So at the beginning of diastole and the end of systole, your semilunar valves have to close um, and your AV valves have to open in order for this to start. And hearing the semilunar, or semilunar valves close is going to be your S2 sound. Um, so in that lub dub of the heart, that second noise, that is your semilunar valves closing. Um, diastole is usually a little longer than systole, so you'll hear a longer pause before you hear the next love. That's how you can, when you're listening to a patient's heartbeat, figure out which is S1 and S2. Um, so an important note that I'll get into a little bit more detail coming up is going to be that since the coronary arteries are located behind the aortic valve, as I showed in the couple slides ago, you actually supply the heart with blood during diastole unlike the rest of the body, which you supply with blood during systole. Uh, we'll explain a little bit more about that, but that's an important note that that is the point in time in which your heart itself is supplied. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. So this is generally the coronary arteries. They arise from the proximal ascending aorta, right at the level of the aortic sinuses, as I showed in that other picture. Uh, behind two out of three of the aortic valve leaflets. So you can see here on this diagram, the green is the right coronary artery and red is the left coronary artery. These are the two major arteries. Um, they are going to approximately encircle the heart and kind of follow all of the grooves that Marianne showed earlier. Um, they're gonna follow the grooves between the atrium and the ventricles and then send off branches that are gonna follow the grooves between the ventricles and they're gonna send little um, extra superficial branches that are going to supply the thick myocardium of the ventricles. And then you do also have uh, a posterior artery that is important and I'll talk a little bit later about why that doesn't quite fit in with the right and left only uh, category. You can go to the next slide. So of the two major arteries, this is the right coronary artery. So as the name would suggest, thankfully, this is pretty instinctive. The right coronary artery is gonna supply the right side of your heart. Um, it's gonna originate behind the anterior aortic sinus. And then as you can see in the diagram, is gonna kind of follow along the groove between the right atrium and the right ventricle, supplying both the right atrium and part of the right ventricle. It'll send off a marginal branch, which is gonna follow, as you can kind of see on the right lateral side of the heart, is gonna supply the right ventricular wall. And then the right coronary artery is continuing to the inferior side of the heart, where it will then branch into the, it might branch into the posterior interventricular artery or the posterior descending artery. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I said it might in a few slides. That is gonna supply the 
inferior portion of the heart. Um, importantly, the right coronary artery supplies the SA node. And we're not going to talk about the electrical conducting system of the heart, but just to mention, in order for the heart to function properly, the atria and the ventricles need to contract in a specific sequence. So the SA node, which is located in the right atrium, is what starts this electrical sequence. So the right coronary artery needs to be able to supply this in order for your heart to function properly. Um, and then the, the electrical system is kind of conducted through the rest of the heart. But that's why having a branch that supplies the SA node from the right coronary artery is going to be really important. And so on the right side of the slide, I have an angiogram of what the right coronary artery looks like. It's pretty distinctive because it's going to make a C shape. Um, you don't have any super large uh, vessels branching off of it, but you can see where the right marginal branch is and where the posterior intraventricular branch is here. And it's really hard to see on the, the angiogram because you don't have any actual representation of the heart itself. Um, so it looks like a very bizarre shape and it's hard to picture how that is the heart, but you're gonna get that kind of distinctive C shape when you see an angiogram of the right coronary artery. Um, when I'm saying supply the heart, so the coronary arteries are taking the blood away from the heart, but because the arteries loop essentially back to the heart, they're supplying the heart itself with blood, if that makes sense. And so then the other major coronary artery is the left coronary artery, which as the name suggests, supplies the left side of the heart. Um, so it originates behind the left posterior aortic sinus, and then is going to kind of go behind the pulmonary artery to supply the left atrium and the left ventricle. So unlike the right coronary artery, the left coronary artery branches immediately kind of into two major branches, um, the left circumflex artery and the left anterior descending artery. So the left circumflex is the first branch off the left coronary artery, and it's gonna follow the AV groove around the left side of the heart. The larger second branch is the left anterior descending artery, which you might see in some places called the left interventricular artery. And this is going to follow the interventricular groove and supply the anterior two thirds of the interventricular septum. Um, so it's gonna essentially follow that groove between the two ventricles down to the apex of the heart. Um, and this is also important because a large amount of the conducting fibers are located within this interventricular septum. So this, unlike the right coronary artery, which supplies the SA node, this is gonna supply kind of what ensures that the ventricles are contracting properly. And so that's really important for having a synchronized uh, contraction of the ventricles to actually expel blood through the rest of the, the arteries into the rest of the body. And so on the right side of this slide, I have the angiogram of the left coronary artery, which unlike the right coronary artery, instead of being a kind of major C shape, you have it branching um, into three vessels. So you can see that the first branch off the left coronary artery is the circumflex, and then there is a larger anterior intraventricular branch, which is also the LAD or left anterior descending artery. Um, and then you have the left marginal branch, which is going to kind of go around the lateral left side of the heart and supply the ventricular wall. The left ventricle is thicker than the right ventricle. The systemic arteries have a higher pressure needed in order to actually get blood through the whole body. If you can imagine the right ventricle only has to pump to the lungs. And as you've seen in these last two weeks, the lungs and the heart are really close to each other. But in order to get blood all the way down to your feet and all the way up to your brain, you really need to generate a lot of pressure. So the left ventricle needs a large supply of blood in order to function correctly to pump that blood away. I think someone's talking. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so I have another clinical case for you guys. So you have a 65 year old man admitted to the ED for severe chest pain that radiates to his neck and left arm. He's tachycardic and diaphoretic, meaning he has a really, tachycardic is a fast heart rate and diaphoretic means you're sweating. Um, EKG or ECG, depending on what you call it, reveals you have a myocardial infarction. So which coronary vessel appears to be occluded on the angiogram? All right, yeah, everybody got it. Yeah, it's the right coronary artery. You can see because it's kind of starting the top part of the C shape and there's no major branches coming off. Um, so you would probably consider this to be a pretty proximal occlusion of the right coronary artery. 
um, but you can see that card of distinctive shape is telling you that it's the right side of the heart that's at risk here, unlike the left side of the heart, um, because the left coronary artery theoretically is still receiving blood. Um, you can use the angiogram to check where the clot is. You can also use it therapeutically if you need to place a stent or to break up the clot. Um, but the EKG is going to be able to tell you where you could predict the clot to be in the vessels. Essentially, each artery has its own distinct territory that, of the heart that it's going to supply. And I didn't get into it too much here, but there isn't a ton of collateral circulation between the arteries, meaning that if you occlude an artery, you then have ischemia due to a loss of blood supply and a loss of oxygen in the liver to a specific part of the heart. And that's going to give a kind of wonky electrical signal on EKG so you can see and localize and essentially predict where you think that clot is in which vessel. Um, and as you might uh, be able to kind of theorize, a proximal occlusion is a lot more severe than a distal occlusion. Essentially, the closer to the aorta you're blocking the blood flow, the less branches of that coronary artery are going to get blood flow and therefore more regions of the heart are going to become ischemic. Um, and just to explain with my kind of clinical presentation, severe chest pain, especially that that radiates to the jaw or the neck and the left arm is very typical of an MI or a heart attack. It is not the only presentation as you might find out. Women don't present like this necessarily, but this is kind of what medicine will tell you is the typical presentation of a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Marianne. So I mentioned this uh, okay, I'll go answer this question real quick with pain radiating to the jaw. We're not going to talk about how the heart is innervated by the spine quite yet. We'll talk about the spine in a later week. But essentially, your body starts to confuse the pain associated with your heart with pain coming from your jaw. So it's going to feel like your jaw is hurting when it's actually your heart. Um, there's a little bit more about that when we actually talk about the nervous system and how that is set up. So I talked a little bit about this earlier with the posterior descending artery or posterior intraventricular artery. This artery is gonna supply the posterior one third of the intraventricular septum on the inferior edge kind of of the heart. And so this is a super variable artery. It can be a branch off the right coronary artery. It can be a branch off the left coronary artery, or it can be supplied by both the right and the left, which you would call codominant. But essentially saying coronary dominance of the heart is which artery is supplying the inferior portion of the heart or the um, posterior one third of the intraventricular septum. And so I put the red box around the two most common. There's the right dominant and left dominant, and then it doesn't include here, but you can have codominant, which is it's pretty split. So this is really important because Knowing the dominance of the heart can tell you if you have a blockage, whether the posterior ventricular septum or the inferior portion of the heart is at risk for ischemia. So if you had a person who had a right dominant heart and they were the same patient from my previous slide who had a right coronary artery occlusion, would you be concerned that their posterior interventricular septum is going to become ischemic? Right. So if your the posterior septum is supplied by the right coronary artery and the right coronary artery is blocked, you're not going to get blood flow there. However, if this was a left dominant heart, even if they had their right coronary artery blocked, which still isn't good, their posterior septum is still going to have blood flow because it's coming from the left coronary artery instead. And so this is really important for um, figuring out what regions of the heart are at risk um, of ischemia if a vessel is blocked. Um, Coronary artery dominance, it differs from person to person. It's super variable. There, you'll find as you do more anatomy, um, there's a lot of variability in how arteries and veins are arranged, but it generally is gonna vary from person to person. There's most likely a genetic cause. I don't know, there's no specific association between them, um, between a specific um, gene and what your posterior intraventricular coronary arteries is branching off of, but it's pretty variable. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So I won't go into too much detail, but there is the venous drainage of the heart. So the vein, this is going to take the deoxygenated blood that 
comes from the heart itself, and then it's going to drain it back into the right atrium. So there are three major coronary uh, cardiac veins, and they are all drained to the coronary sinus. So the coronary sinus is, as you can see in the right picture, kind of a very large vessel on the inferior portion of the heart right below the pulmonary veins that's going to drain into the right atrium along with the IVC and the SVC. And so each vein is going to approximately drain the territory of one kind of paired coronary artery. And unfortunately, I don't have a good picture on this slide, but each of the major coronary veins kind of um, travels along with one of the coronary arteries. It's just moving blood in the opposite direction. So you have your great cardiac vein, which is going to follow your LAD, um, and it's going to drain the anterior interventricular groove in the same way that your left anterior descending artery supplies your anterior inter interventricular groove and part of the left ventricle. Uh, you have your middle cardiac vein. This is going to follow the posterior descending artery or the posterior interventricular artery and kind of drain the inferior surface of the heart. And then you have your small cardiac vein, which is paired with the right coronary artery um, along the right side of the heart, and it drains the same territory the right coronary artery supplies, which is the right side of the heart. And so all of this deoxygenated blood drains back into the right atrium, where it then can be returned to the lungs for oxygenation and then sent back to the heart to supply it. And so you can go to the next slide. So if you've ever watched Grey's Anatomy or TV show and you hear people talking about a cabbage, this is what it is. It's called a coronary artery bypass graft. Um, essentially, since your heart lacks collateral circulation, if you lose blood supply to a region of the heart by blocking an artery, you need that artery to resupply the blood. You don't have another artery that's gonna take over for it like you do in the rest of the body. So if you have a blockage of the coronary artery that you can't treat otherwise, you can bypass it. In this case, you're essentially taking a vessel, you're taking some kind of blood vessel, and you're gonna attach it to the coronary artery distal to the occlusion so that you now essentially have like taken a detour from the normal supply of blood route, like if you were trying to avoid a traffic jam, and you're gonna then get your blood supply to that same part of the heart that would be ischemic if the occlusion was still there. You can either relocate an existing artery or you can graft a new vessel. So you can see from this diagram, the artery graft is essentially you're relocating what's called your internal thoracic, your internal mammary artery. Um, it's coming off of your left subclavian artery and you're essentially gonna take it away from its spot in the chest wall and you're gonna attach it to the part of the coronary artery distal to the occlusion. Um, importantly, you don't lose supply to the chest wall because you have other arteries that are there to continue supplying that muscle and the structures. Your other options, instead of taking a pre-existing artery and relocating it to the heart, is you can graft. Um, you can use a venous graft, a vein graft, or an artery graft. I believe the vein graft is usually the saphenous vein from your leg, and I think an arterial graft can be your radial artery. But in this case, you're attaching one side of this vessel to your proximal ascending aorta, and the other uh, side of the vessel is going to attach to the coronary artery distal to the occlusion. So this allows blood to be restored to the region that would not receive blood if the occlusion was still there. Um, so if you've heard like single, double, triple, quadruple bypass, that just means how many um, essentially grafted vessels you have supplying the heart. So I know this was a lot of information and we kind of jumped back and forth on topics, but as Marianne was saying, really the best way to learn this is to keep learning it as a whole. The only real way to understand how the anatomy matches, the function matches the blood supply is to kind of learn it in one go with all the information together. So if it takes you several tries and you're going through the PowerPoint several times in order to really understand how everything connects, um, that's probably the best way to learn it. If you have any questions, you're welcome to email either of us about it. We're happy to talk about it. Uh, this was one of the last things we learned in our first year. So all of the information on uh, cardiac anatomy is pretty fresh in our brains. And I was also just seeing a lot of questions in terms that people were confused about the fact that, so since arteries take blood away from the heart, why we're saying that the coronary arteries supply the heart with blood. And that's also confusing that I had, but the way that it clicked for me was thinking that so the heart's main blood is the heart's main function is a pump. So it's a it's a muscle that pumps the blood to the heart. But since the heart is a muscle itself, the heart also needs its own oxygen, or else that muscle is going to die. So the coronary arteries, like I think Morgan and Madison answered it very, very well, is that 
the coronary arteries are kind of that exception to the rule is that the coronary arteries are arteries and that they are coming out from the heart. But since the heart also needs its own oxygen, those coronary arteries are kind of going to come back to the heart and supply the actual heart muscle, the myocardium with oxygen. So if you think of it that way and that that is the exception and that the heart also needs its own oxygen and the coronary arteries are the way to do that. And that hopefully that makes a little more sense. And I know that uh, the other MS2s answered the questions uh, on the chat. Great. Um, so yeah, we're out of time, but thank you guys so much. And again, feel free to email. And again, these slides are uh, on the Google Drive. So feel free to use these as study tools. Uh, these are great, great images. So uh, we encourage you guys to go back um, and review these. Thank you guys so much for coming and speaking today. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for organizing everything. Dr. Langer, are you still here? You want to say any last words? All right. Um, well, thanks everyone for coming out today. It was a, another great week of brain turns. I hope to see everybody next week.